Luke chapter 5, we'll read verses 12 through 16. And as we read, I really want us to focus on two things. Now, as we read, you're going to kind of wonder, what does sin have to do with Luke chapter 5? But I want to focus on the problem, of, the problem of sin and then the solution to sin. The problem of sin and the solution to sin. And we find something pretty cool, very interesting here in Luke chapter 5. Are you guys there? All right, I'll wait. If you're there, Bible's above the heads or phones. And repeat after me. No, keep the Bible's above the heads. And repeat after me. I love God. I love God's Word. I love candy. Candy canes. Candy corn. And syrup. All right, let's read. You're ready. I just wanted to see... If you're in the spiritual mood, um, and I can tell the Holy Spirit's really moving and working in your life. Luke chapter 5, verse 12. Does anybody know what that's from? Elf. Elf. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm not just totally weird. That, that was a movie line. But why would I mention that movie line right now? I, I don't know, so I, I am weird. Okay, Luke chapter 5, verse 12. It says this, And it happened when he... Now, who is the he... Jesus, okay, that was the classic Bible question, what did you learn about today in Sunday school, Jesus, okay, so don't be afraid, and it happened when Jesus was in a certain city, that behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus, and he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand, that is Jesus, Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately, the leprosy left him, and he charged him to tell no one, but go, Jesus said, and show yourself to the priest, and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. However, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Let's do exactly that. Let's pray. Lord, we just come before you tonight and we are ready to hear from you, Lord. We're, we're, we're ready to learn from your Holy Spirit. And I pray that as we read through this passage of Scripture and as we dig it out a little bit more and as we talk about you, I pray that by your Spirit you would speak to us. That's why we're here tonight, Lord, to hear from you and to become more like you, Lord, to be shaped more into your image. And so I pray that you would mature us, that you would grow us, that you would do a new and a fresh work in our hearts and in our lives tonight. We love you. I thank you for my brothers and sisters in this room. And we just pray that you would be here, Lord. We invite you here. Um, And so we love you, God, and we look forward to hearing from you and, and learning through your word tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody together said, Amen. So the writer here, his name is Luke. Okay, now Luke, by profession, Luke was a doctor. Now that's very important to note because if you read throughout the Gospel of Luke, Luke is one of the guys, uh, more so than the other Gospels, who points out some of the medicinal things that Jesus does. Jesus is a healer. Luke loves to point that out because Luke, by profession, we know is a doctor. Uh, Most Bible scholars believe that Luke was a Gentile, that he actually wasn't a Jew, but he was a Gentile, Um, and again, he loves to point out the miracles, especially the healing miracles of Jesus. Luke is the only gospel to point out. Um, Remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he was about to be crucified and nailed to a cross? The gospel of Luke actually records that Jesus sweat droplets of blood. And that's actually, uh, in medicine, that's a, a recorded kind of phenomenon that when people are under so much stress and anxiety that they can actually sweat, the capillaries in their forehead actually break and they can sweat droplets of blood. And Luke records that. Being a doctor, he loves those kind of small details. So he records that when Jesus is in the garden, that Jesus under the immense weight and pressure of his upcoming crucifixion, that he actually sweat droplets of blood. So Luke records that being a doctor here. He's very meticulous when it comes to these kinds of details. And so here we find ourselves, 
Luke, the doctor's writing, Luke chapter 5, and he talks about this leper who gets healed by Jesus. So let's make our way through the text here, verse 12. It says, And it happened when Jesus was in a certain city. So the city goes unnamed here, but we know that Jesus is doing ministry in the Galilee region. Now, the Galilee region is a very large region. So it's a city within the Galilee region. I want you to think of it kind of as Loudoun County. So Loudoun County, within Loudoun County, there are several different towns, several different cities, okay? And so Galilee, the Galilee region, has different towns, different cities. So Jesus is in an unnamed city, but he's in the Galilee region. Uh, Josephus, the ancient historian, notes that there were 207 towns in the region of Galilee. And that probably, during Jesus' time, there were roughly 2 million people in the Galilee region. So, very large region. region. I think in Loudoun County there are between 400 and 500,000 people. So, Galilee region, roughly 2 million people we're talking. Jesus is in an unnamed city. But because of his miracles, because of his, his teaching, uh, the people, the Bible says all throughout the Gospels, the people are amazed at what Jesus is doing. So he's attracting a very large crowd here. Very popular guy at this point of his ministry. Okay, he's later hated and nailed to a cross. But he's very popular at this time because he's doing all these miracles. He's healing people. He's, he's preaching. He's teaching. Draws large crowds to him. And so we see here that he then encounters a man in verse 12. It happened when he was in a certain city that, behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus. The NIV says that this man was covered with leprosy. Now, leprosy was a very debilitating disease. You would eventually die from leprosy. It was a very painful, a very slow death. It took about 10 to 20 years to eventually kill you. So this man being covered with leprosy, probably at the latter stages of this debilitating disease, all right, maybe has this disease for 10, 15, 20 years. This skin disease that would affect the skin, you'd break out in rash all over your body, okay, white, red blotches all over the skin, but it was progressive. Okay, so it would start out small, it would attack your flesh, Progressive, it would then spread all throughout your body, and then it would actually affect the central nervous system to where you actually lost the sense of feeling. And because you lost sensation, it would actually lead to further injuries because it desensitized you so that you actually couldn't even feel. You know, if you were to touch something hot, if you were to like get bumped or or knock your shoulder against something, you know, it would then start to affect you in other ways because it completely desensitized your central nervous system. Couldn't feel, so you'd be walking around, bumping into things, all right, touching a hot stove, you couldn't feel something, so then you would start to actually lose limbs. You'd lose fingers, you'd lose toes. And so this was the debilitating effects of this skin disease, painful oozing sores, it was actually uncurable until 1873 uh, by Dr. G. A. Hansen, and then it was so it was later called Hansen's disease. But he found the underlying uh, symptoms of what was actually causing this skin disease called leprosy. And I mean, think of it: thousands and thousands of years, no cure for leprosy until 1873. And the World Health Organization actually reports that even today, so leprosy still exists, even though there is a cure. But the World Health Organization says that there's still 200,000 cases of leprosy in the world today. And I was reading uh, this report that said that in Loudoun County, there are 10. I just made that part up. I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're now looking around like, oh, like, who has it? Like, I had this rash on my elbow the other day. Like, I've got leprosy. Okay, don't. You, you don't. I mean, maybe you do. I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. But 200,000 cases still in the world, and so this still affects people more so in third world, third world countries where they don't have access to medicine, but this is you know, still a disease today. 
And in this day, specifically in Jewish culture, because God actually speaks about skin diseases in Leviticus chapter 13, in this specific day and age, in this culture, lepers were completely ostracized because it was infectious. And so they they were completely isolated. Leviticus chapter 13, God actually gives instructions by which to live and quarantine people with infectious skin diseases. So in Leviticus 13, he actually speaks through his prophet, Prophet Fauci, and he mentions... (laughs) Okay, that was a joke. That was a joke. (laughs) In Leviticus chapter 13, he, he mentions... God outlines some instructions like, hey, if you have a specific skin disease or skin infection, this is what you're supposed to do. And you're supposed to wear torn clothes. You have to keep your hair unkempt. You had to cover the lower part of your face. All right, everywhere you went in the public sphere, you had to cry out, unclean, unclean. You had to live alone. You had to live outside of the camp, okay? So this was God's provision, essentially, to protect the larger body so that other people wouldn't catch this infectious skin disease. But as a result of this, if you were a leper, you were completely ostracized. You're completely isolated. I mean, can you imagine that? People would be completely isolated from their families, from their community. Even people in that day, if you had leprosy, you actually, the norm was to attach bells to the hem of your garment so that if you were walking around someone's camp or maybe within the public square, people could actually hear you coming because the bells were basically the signal that a leper was coming. I mean, can you imagine how embarrassing that would be? Wearing bells on the hem of your garment and crying out unclean, your hair is unkempt. You you had to tear your clothes so that everywhere you went, it was the signal that something was wrong with you. Totally embarrassing. But it's so important to realize here, because I want you to notice what Jesus does when he comes in contact with this guy. The very first thing he does, look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, then Jesus, so backing up a little bit, the the leper, he falls on his face, sees Jesus, comes to the Lord, he says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Verse 13, Jesus puts out his hand and touches him. And he says, I am willing, be cleansed. So the man's covered with leprosy. Again, probably the latter stages of this disease. Maybe he's had it 15, 20 years. Can you imagine this guy right here probably hasn't been hugged, probably hasn't been touched for at least a decade. Hasn't experienced any physical contact. And the very first thing that Jesus does, what does he do? He touches him. He touches this man. And it's a beautiful picture of Jesus' compassion here He touches him and he says, I'm willing, be cleansed. And the Bible says, immediately. Immediately. Imagine the incredible healing, this incredible scene. Again, maybe this guy, after having had leprosy for 10, 15, 20 years, again, it affects your central nervous system, so you can't feel. Maybe this guy has lost limbs, lost fingers, lost toes. All right, so picture this scene with me. Jesus touches the man. This guy immediately is completely healed. Fingers are popping out every like just coming out of nowhere, like toes, like coming back, like an arm grows. I have no idea. But this scene would have been pretty incredible here. Jesus touches the man and immediately he says, I'm willing to be cleansed. And it says immediately, no, no hesitation. The guy's completely cleansed. And in verse 14, this is kind of strange. He charges the man, don't tell anyone. Now this was pretty common throughout the Gospels where Jesus would do a miraculous healing, cast out a demon. He says, actually, don't tell anyone. Now a lot of people question, like, why would Jesus not want anyone to know? Isn't that why he came? So that people would know that he's the Messiah. The reason for you know, coming to the world was so that Jesus could make known the plan of salvation to everyone. But Jesus often through the Gospels, you read it, he, he tells them, hey, don't, don't tell anyone. And it's because Jesus was on a specific timetable. This is just kind of a side note to our study. Jesus was on a divine timetable. He didn't want the people to make him king too early in his ministry. you got to imagine the, the Jewish mindset was that this Messiah was going to liberate them from their Roman oppression. This is the Messiah. He's going to overthrow the Romans. We're going to be the dominant world empire. There's going to be peace among the world. 
Jesus, you are the guy, you're doing all these miracles, you're, you have miraculous powers, you're the son of God, so we want to make you king. The Bible actually says that the people attempted to make him king too early. But Jesus, this wasn't his idea of his first coming. His first coming was to die on a cross for the sin of the world. And so he tells the person, he tells this man who was cured with leprosy, listen, don't tell anyone because he was on a divine timetable. God had a purpose for Jesus. He was on this divine, perfect timetable according to God's timing, God's will. Okay, just a side note, Jesus had a perfect timing. God has a perfect timing for you. Not saying that we are the Messiah, that we are Jesus, but practically speaking, I know many of you are concerned or worried about, you know, when's the right time to be married? When's the right time to start this, venture into this career, get frustrated? Why isn't anything happening? Why, you know, have a lot of expectation about your life? Listen, focus on the Lord. Keep your eyes fixed on Him. Get in the Word. Read the Word. Study the Word. Love Jesus. Jesus is going to take care of your timing. You know, he's going he's gonna to work everything out. He's weaving your beautiful story together, but it's in his timing. It's in his timing, so just trust him. Don't try to manipulate things, force things. Jesus could have told this guy with leprosy, hey, go spread the word. Go tell everyone who I am. Because, I, you know, let's go. But God had a perfect timing for Jesus Christ, and God has perfect timing for you, So don't be so consumed with thoughts and questions about when is this going to happen. Just trust the Lord. The Lord has a perfect timing for you. But Jesus here, he he tells the man, don't tell anyone, but he rather says, go, show yourself to the priest, make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. Jesus is pointing him back to what was written in Leviticus. If you were healed from an infection, go show yourself to the priest, make an offering to the Lord. So Jesus is telling him, listen, just obey the word, don't, you know, don't tell anyone, but, you know, as it so happens often throughout the Gospels, people can't keep their big mouths shut. And this guy who was healed with leprosy, it says, however, the report went around concerning Jesus all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by Jesus of their infirmities. So Jesus himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Jesus is like, gotta get alone. And the more Jesus poured out, he recognized he had to be filled up with his Father by spending time with him. And so the news spreads about Jesus all the more. Here's what I want to point out. Here's where I want to really focus our study in, uh, with the time we have remaining is the, the problem of sin. Now, still at this point, you might be wondering, okay, leprosy, man was healed, sin, not really sure how that correlates. Here's how it connects. Isaiah the prophet says this in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 6. He makes an analogy between leprosy and sin. And he basically says that leprosy, how it affects us physically, is exactly how sin affects us spiritually. And Isaiah, he wrote this in Isaiah 1, 4 through 6. He says, Woe to the sinful nation! a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. Okay, so he's talking about the nation of Israel, talking about how they've been rebellious, how they've been obstinate. They've turned their backs on God, calls them a rebellious people who've forsaken the Lord. And then he says this in verse 5, why should you be beaten anymore. Why do you persist in rebellion? Listen, your whole head is injured, physical. Your whole heart is afflicted, spiritual. From the soles of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with olive oil. So he makes this connection here between rebellion, sin against the Lord, and having infected wounds all over your body. And he connects them and he says, how you've been rebelling against the Lord, your sin, 
This is exactly what takes place physically. You're basically like a body wounded with infectious sores because of your obstinate sin and rebellion against the Lord. And leprosy is exactly like this. Leprosy, the analogy between leprosy and sin, leprosy, it starts out small. We see this practically, physically, that when someone first has leprosy, it just starts off like a small rash. We see this medically speaking, documented. It starts out just like a small rash. Not a big deal. This is what sin is. Sin starts out small. Just did that once. Just trying this out. Just going here, just going there. Just, just once. Really don't think much about it because it starts out small. Okay, everybody makes mistakes, right? And this is exactly what sin does in our hearts. Spiritually speaking, sin starts out small. No one gets to a large, huge, big, grievous sin just right off the bat. It's gradual. It starts out small. The affair. Just didn't happen just to be an affair. Okay, it started in the mind, started with lust, started with fantasizing, started with opportunity, started out small. This is what sin does to our lives. And then we try to cover it up. You know, leprosy, we try to cover it up in Scripture. And maybe you've seen it played out in like Jesus movies. Anyone who is like sick with a skin disease or leprosy, they're all bandaged up. And because it's embarrassing. You don't want to walk out publicly with all those open sores. And so what do you do? You bandage it up. You cover it up because it's embarrassing. And this is what we do with sin in our lives. You know, we cover it up because we... We want to go to church. We want to put on our church happy Sunday face, happy Monday night face. And we don't want anyone to know that inside we've been really dealing with something. We've been struggling with something. And so we try to cover it up. We try to mask it. And this is leprosy. This is sin. And then it starts to slowly consume our flesh. Because then the more we just engage in sin, though it starts out small, it starts out slow, but it just progresses and the more we just indulge in it, it just starts to consume us. It just starts to consume our mind, consume our heart, consume our tongue, consume our behavior. So it consumes us, just like leprosy does. And then what ends up happening with leprosy, remember, you lose all sensitivity because it, it affects your central nervous system. So it desensitizes you, leprosy does. So when you start to touch surfaces, you know you shouldn't be playing with, or you know you shouldn't be touching that because it's a hot stove, because you're desensitized now by the skin infection, you don't even know that it's affecting you. This is what sin does in our hearts. The more we indulge in sin, the more we engage in it, the more we gossip, the more it just becomes a part of us, and we actually become desensitized to it. We, we lose all sensitivity. We don't even know that we're indulging or partaking in it any longer because we're, we're desensitized to it. You know, I've, I'm just desensitized to language now in movies because, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not speaking this about me personally, and, and I'm not saying this to be self-righteous. I, this is just me. I'm not trying to, and this isn't in my notes, and maybe the Lord's just giving this for whoever. I don't watch rated R movies. That's just me. I'm not saying that that has to be you. But the reason I don't is because the more I hear specific language, I don't want to become desensitized to all that language because it's not good for my mind. It's not good for my spirit. The Bible says, don't be drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So I don't want to be drunk on language. I don't want to be drunk on, you know, sensual scenes. I I don't want to fill my heart and mind with anything that might compromise my own, you know, my own behavior, my own actions. So just that's like a, that's a boundary that my wife and I have within our own home. We don't watch certain movies because I just want to fill my mind with all of it because I know what will happen you know, if, if I just watch more of those movies and I'm not coming against movies, I love movies, love movies, love books, love all that stuff. I'm just saying the more I indulge in that and the more I hear it and the more it comes in my ears, the more I'm just going to be sensi- desensitized to it. And, and I know, you know, speaking to you know, different people, you know, oh, like, did you watch that movie? And it was like, yeah, I, could, I had to turn it off. So much language. It's like, I didn't even realize it. It's like, yeah, because then you watch it and listen to it so much 
that you don't even realize, you're, you're desensitized to when you see something or hear something that's not godly or doesn't honor the Lord. That's, that's, as a believer in Jesus Christ, that's not, that's not where I want to be. That's not where I want us as body believers to be. Well, we're at the point where now we're seeing things, we're hearing things, and we're just desensitized to it because we hear all the time. But leprosy, it desensitizes you, so when you get to an area you, you really shouldn't be around, like a hot stove, you don't realize how it's affecting you, and that's what sin does in our hearts. That's what sin does in our minds. The more we just, it becomes a part of our natural pattern, our natural routine, we become desensitized. We lose all sensitivity to what might grieve the Holy Spirit. So I want to be at a place And Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, though I am seeking to attain perfection, I'm not there yet. I never will be, not until I'm in the presence of the Lord in all of eternity. That's Philippians chapter 3, I paraphrase. But I want to be, and I want us to be, I, I want us to be progressing in the Lord, maturing in the Lord, so that the more you progress in the Lord, the more you're in the Word, the more you're seeking the Lord, you just become more aware of what grieves the Lord, and you just become more sensitive. I want to be at a place in my spiritual walk with the Lord where I'm just sensitive to what's around me. I'm, a sens- I'm sensitive to what I'm feeding myself, uh, physically, spiritually. Just, I just want to be sensitive to what might be dishonoring the Lord in my heart and in my life. And I don't want to be a believer who just, I'm just desensitized and I lose sensitivity to what might be dishonoring the Lord. But this is what sin does. This is what the, the sin, when we indulge in, just affects us that way. And we sometimes don't even realize it because we've lost sensitivity. And then sin isolates us. The more we engage and indulge in sin, the more we just want to disengage from fellowship with other believers. Because we're embarrassed by our sin, it's difficult for us to confess sin to talk about sin, and so we just start to isolate ourselves, and we start to be a part of environments where we know that our behavior is easily accepted, because everyone's doing it, right? And so sin, just like leprosy isolates you, sin will do that. Sin will isolate you, and God doesn't want you to be isolated. He wants you to be in fellowship with other believers, okay? That's why, like, seriously, open the churches, if, if churches are still closed, I have no idea why. Open the churches, let people come in, fellowship with other believers, because Satan loves to attack us in our isolation, in our temptation. Don't be alone. Get out of isolation. Be with people who love Jesus, who are following Jesus, because sin loves to isolate you And Satan loves to take advantage of your isolation because he has you all alone and he can feed you lies. He can feed you uh, discouragement. He can feed you further temptation. He can get you into the wrong crowds. Don't be isolated. Get with people who love Jesus, but sin isolates you just like leprosy does. And then finally, it eventually kills you. And that's what Paul says in the book of Galatians. Are you going to feed the spirit? Are you going to feed the flesh? Because if you feed the spirit, that will reap everlasting life. But if you feed the flesh, that will reap corruption. So wake up today or tomorrow morning and ask yourself the question, who am I going to feed today? Am I going to feed the Spirit? Because if I feed the Spirit with the Word of God, put on, put on some worship music, watch a message, listen to a podcast, get around people who love Jesus, I'm feeding the Spirit, I'm in prayer, I'm going to reap everlasting life, going to mature in my faith. But if you feed the flesh, it's only going to reap corruption. That's what Paul says, Galatians chapter 5 and 6. And this is what leprosy does. But there is a solution to all this. You know, we could pray, be dismissed, and be like, wow, that was really heavy. Um, Let's go enjoy some popsicles and ice cream on this uh, sad note of sin. But there is a solution here, a solution to sin. And it's really simple to understand the solution to sin. We overcomplicate the life of a believer. But really, if if you want alliteration, I love alliteration, just the three R's. Recognize recognize, repent, and return. Okay, the very first thing, the solution to sin, this man, he encounters Jesus. Jesus touches this man. Immediately, the man is healed. But the man first obviously recognized that he was in that 
leprous condition to realize that he needed a remedy, right? Many of us, we don't even first recognize, that's the first point, recognize your sin. Many of us don't deal with our sin because we don't even recognize that we have a problem. So the very first step to the solution to sin is recognize that you're a sinner. That's what the Bible says, Romans chapter 3, 23, all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. The earth and humanity is basically one big leprous colony, all right? We're all sinners, that's what the Bible says. But the reason that people don't even recognize their own wickedness and they don't think that they're all that bad, the reason why we don't think we're all that bad is because we're all a part of the leper colony. We all look the same. And so we compare ourselves to other lepers. You're like, oh yeah, I'm a leper, you're a leper. Like, what? we don't have a problem. We're, we all look the same. And so you don't even recognize your own wickedness because everyone's a part of this leprous colony. If the whole world were just a giant leper colony, everyone would think like, hey, we're all fine because you had nothing to compare it to. And so what we do is we compare ourselves with other sinners and we don't think we're that bad. All right, we, we, we look like sinners, we talk like sinners, we think that we're all doing pretty good because we're all a part of the leper colony. All right, anybody know what this is? Platypus. Did any of you just like, any of you thinking Phineas and Ferb right now? Okay, shut up. Okay. So this is a platypus. Now listen, this is an ugly looking creature. Okay, I'm just being honest. It is. Okay, listen. For those of you who say, oh, this is a cute little pat." Yeah, wake up next to this in bed. You ain't going to cuddle next to it, okay? This is weird. All right, so this is a platypus. Um, I guess maybe the plural for, is it platypi? Is that the plural for platy, platypus? Platypi, okay. So this is, a, this is an ugly looking creature. Now listen, to other platypus, other platypi, all right, this thing looks great because they're all a part of the platypus family. All right, Mrs. Platypus is very attracted to Mr. Platypus because they all look the same. All right, so we think, I mean, at least I do. I just found out tonight that other people don't think that this is a weird-looking creature that God created on day 10, probably. So this is a weird-looking creature, but not to other platypus. Uh, to other platypus, they all look great. All right, this is us. We all, we all think like, hey, I'm not, I look pretty good because we're comparing ourselves to other people. But when you recognize your sin and you compare yourself in light of Jesus Christ, then you start to realize how dirty and filthy you are. All right, it's kind of like taking a bath. Does anybody, raise your hand if you still like to take baths. All right, look around. Those are the weirdos in the room. Okay, stay away from them. Those are the pedophiles. No, I'm kidding. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. The, the Holy Spirit didn't catch me in time. Okay, I'm, I like to take baths. And I'm not saying I'm a pedophile. I'm so sorry. You know what? Let's just pray. Let's just pray. Lord, we just... Forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. Let's, re let's rewind just 20 seconds. Okay. Um, that did not come out right. Um, why was I talking about baths? Okay. I like to take baths. Okay, I, I, love, I love baths. Um, so, platypus, sin, baths. Okay, bring it back. Um, it's just like taking a bath, okay? If you go into a bath, you don't even necessarily... Okay, bring, bring it back, bring it back. You don't even realize how dirty you are until you jump into something that's clean. All right, so if you've been cutting the grass or you've been playing outside, whatever, you don't even realize the extent of your filth until after you take a bath and then you see, man, that water was brown. That water was gross. There's a brown ring around this bathtub. This is weird. This is gross. This, this is how dirty I was. But you don't have an understanding of your own filth until you're put into something that can cleanse you. And so this is, this is us as sinners. We don't even realize the extent of our wickedness, the extent of our filth, the extent of how dirty we are until we place ourselves into the cleansing arms of Jesus Christ and he washes us and then we realize in light of who Jesus is, this is how dirty I am. But we need to first recognize 
that we're sinners because it's not until you recognize your sin that then you'll do the second R and actually repent of your sin. And this is why God came into the world. He took on flesh to touch us, to bring healness, healing and wholeness to our hearts. So recognize your sin. Recognize that you're wicked. Don't compare yourselves to other people. You can always find a worse sinner than you. Compare yourself to the Word and, and to the perfect Son of God, Jesus Christ, and then you realize just how dirty you are. Listen, a lot of people attempt to use Jesus as just a band-aid. I'm just going to use Jesus as a bandage for my sin. You recognize that you're not perfect, but you just want Jesus to do some patchwork in your life. So you run into some bumps. You have some tough seasons. Things get hard. And so you treat Jesus like a band-aid. You go to Jesus. Jesus, I need a patch, a patch job. I need, need you to bandage me up. I need you to do your patchwork on me. You know, you recognize you're not perfect. But listen, Jesus did not come to be your band-aid. He came to be your healer, completely healing you, completely making you whole. How silly would that have been if this leprous man fell on his face before Jesus and he said, Jesus, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus touches him and says, I am willing. And he started to put band-aids on the guy. He started just to wrap him in more gauze. That would have only remedied the symptoms for a small period of time. It would have done nothing about the root cause of the problem. And a lot of us treat Jesus as just this bandage. If I can just put on Jesus and I can just add Jesus to my life, then I'll be fine. But listen, Jesus doesn't want you to just add him to your life. He wants to completely fill you and make you into a new person. He wants to completely remedy the sin problem. Not just doing this quick bandage, this quick patch on the arm. He wants to completely fill you, make you a new person, make you a new creature. That's what Jesus did to this man who had this debilitating disease. He didn't just bandage the problem to provide some temporary solution. He says, I am the permanent solution to your wounds, to your hurt, to your pain, to your sin. You come to me, you humble yourself, you fall on your face before me, and I can do the healing work that no other substance, no other person, no other thing can do in your life. You come to me, you surrender yourself to me, I will completely heal you. I'm the solution to your sin. You have to recognize it first, and then you have to repent. We just like to add Jesus to our lives. The, Christians, the Christian life's not just living out our lives as usual, and then just adding Jesus to our lives. It's giving them full reign, full control over every area. Your money, your finances, your relationships, your work, your career, your conduct and behavior, your friendships. So we have to recognize our disease. It's called sin. And then the Bible calls us to repent and return. It's not about just patching up your sin. It's about repenting of your sin and this is what Acts 3.19 says, Repent then and turn. The two things right in that one verse. Repent and turn. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Not just temporarily taken care of, but so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. So will you allow Jesus to do a whole new work in your life and stop living a life full of patches. The solution to our sin is encountering Christ and allowing Him to heal you and make you whole. Repenting of your sin, repent, the Greek word metanoia, and it literally means to change one's mind. So you're going a certain direction, you change your mind and you return to the Lord. So you recognize your sinful state, you repent, you change your heart, you change your mind, you turn to the Lord. And the Lord says, when you repent, when you humble yourself, my arms are wide open. The psalmist says, as far as the east is from the west, so far will I remove your sins from you. So come as you are. Listen, this is the other misconception of Christianity, that you have to clean yourself up before you find yourself worthy 
to be in Jesus' presence. It would have been impossible for this man of leprosy to cleanse himself before he encountered Jesus. The Bible and the gospel doesn't teach. You need to clean yourself up and get your act together before you're ready to come to God. God says, that's the reason why I sent Jesus, so that when you humble yourself, you recognize your sin, you turn from it, you say, I don't want any part of sin anymore. You come to Jesus. Jesus does the cleansing, healing work. That's why Acts 3.19 says, repent, turn to God, so that times of refreshing may come in. Jesus is the cleanser. Jesus is the healer. So come as you are, a spotted leper in all of your sin and in all of your shame, and allow Jesus to touch you, allow Jesus to heal you and fill you and make you a new creation. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Revelation 21.5, Jesus said, Behold, I make all things new. And so what I want to do, we're just going to pray, and maybe for the very first time, you, you want to make a decision for Christ. You want to turn from your sin. You want to repent of it. You want to turn to God, and you want God to make you into a new creature. If that's you for the first time tonight, as we pray, just whisper a prayer into your heart before the Lord and just say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Heal me. Touch me. Make me into a new creature. That can be you tonight but you have to humble yourself and make that decision. And when you turn from sin and you come to the cross and you recognize that Jesus died for your sin and he rose again from the dead to heal you from this disease that will kill you called sin, you recognize what Jesus did. He promises to heal you, to touch you. And it doesn't mean that you then will live a sinless life but it means now that God sees you not as this leprous sinner, but he sees you as he sees his son, Jesus. And as you progress in him, you will begin to sin less until you're perfected in his presence. Maybe you, you, you're a Christian, you're a believer, you've accepted Christ, but you've just been really struggling with certain sin. Maybe it's your tongue, maybe it's gossip. Maybe you just realized you've been desensitized to things and you just want to you want the Holy Spirit to awaken your senses back because you realize you've been desensitized to other things, to people, to shows, to whatever. I don't know what it is for you, but maybe you just want to just tonight, you just want to use tonight as a place of just repentance where you just say, Lord, I want to turn from sin. I'm done indulging in this and I want you to forgive me. And you just make this an intimate moment between you and the Lord where you just confess sin and you get right with him. Because this is the walk of the daily Christian. Because I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we, we will still sin, but you want to just continually just, you want to have a short record with the Lord. You want to just confess sin to the Lord. Right, in my marriage to my wife, my, my wife and I, we're married, we will always be married, we're in a covenant relationship, but there are times I hurt her, she hurts me, hurts my feelings, I hurt her feelings, and and because we're married in this covenant relationship, it just is, it doesn't mean I can stop apologizing and start, can, you know, stop stop apologizing and just say, hey, like, we're married, just get over it, you know? But it's this constant, like, just when I hurt her, offend her, just this constant, you know, I want to be right with you. I want to apologize for how I've hurt you. All right, and this is our relationship with the Lord. You're a Christian. You're a believer. The Holy Spirit is in you. But we, we confess sin. We want to just keep our hearts tender towards sin and towards the Lord. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer now. And I first want to just open, open this up. If you want to make Jesus the Lord of your heart tonight, if you've never done that, and you want to turn from sin, as we just bow our heads now, if that's you, you want to make a decision for Jesus, just whisper into your heart a prayer like this, Lord Jesus, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I turn from my sin and I turn to you now, God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin and rose from the dead. Forgive me of my sin. I put my faith and trust in you. Come into my heart and life and make me a new creature. 
in Jesus' name. For the believers in the room, you just want to get right with God. You just want to confess sin. Just take 30 seconds and just between you and the Lord, just confess sin to Him. Just resolve in your heart to turn from sin and to ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Just get right with Him now. Just whisper a prayer in your heart. God, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for being the healer. Thank you, Lord, for being our restorer. You not only have the power to heal us physically, as we obviously see that in Scripture, but you eternally desire to heal us from sin And you did that when you sent your son Jesus to be sin for us, to be our punishment. So we just thank you, Lord, for being our eternal healer. I pray for this group tonight, wherever there is sin, I pray that we'd be quick to confess it to you, Lord. I'm sure there are different struggles, a variety of different struggles all throughout the room. And I just pray that by your Holy Spirit, Lord, we can't do this on our own. I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit living in us, that you would help us to continually turn from sin, to repent of it, and to turn towards you, Lord. And that you would, by your power, by your strength living in us, that you would help us to continually put sin off, to put sin to the side, that we would turn to you, that we would grow in you, that we would mature in you, that you would make us and mold us and shape us more into your image, Lord. Help us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for not leaving us in our sin, but thank you for creating a solution in Jesus Christ that by his wounds we might be healed. So we praise you, Lord, tonight. We thank you, Lord, for being our eternal remedy, the remedy from sin. We love you. We look to you. We trust now that as we've studied your word and as we've read it and dug it out and as as we've sought you tonight and confessed sin to you tonight, hopefully some getting saved for the first time, now we trust, Lord, that you will go before us, that you will strengthen us by your spirit, that you will do your part, Lord. You are sovereign and in control. And we do this all according to your will, Lord. We desire to turn from sin, to come to the cross, to come to you. Now fill us, Lord, with your spirit, by your grace and compassion and mercy. Would you touch us and would you help us to live lives that honor you, Lord? We love you, we praise you, we thank you for who you are in our lives, for who you are in our young adult community. We give you the rest of our week now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody together said, amen and amen.